Good morning. Can you close the door, please? Yeah. So far, we have discussed about the transformation in fibrous alloy, in particular, the diffusion process control the uh, transformation kinetics. So uh, from now on, I will uh, focus on the uh, another type of the transformation which can be observed in the ion its alloy, which is called the Martensitic transformation. So the Martensitic transformation is quite particular special transformation observed in the ion and its alloy uh, compared to the transformation governed by the diffusion the transformation kinetic itself is quite fast because it does not require the diffusion of any atoms and also in in terms of engineering application multi-site give you quite a big chance to develop the high strength steel cause the hardness and strength of the uh, steel which, uh, of which microstructure is, martensite is really uh, high compared to the uh, other microstructures which is formed by the diffusion process like the ferrite, polite, and and others. To understand the basic concept of the Martensite transformation, you have to understand what kind of mechanism governs the transformation from the FCC to BCC, and how we can convert FCC structure to BCC structure without contribution of the diffusion. So basically, I will follow the textbook written by Professor Harry Vadesha. And you can download this book from the homepage of the CML. And it's quite good book and uh, explain quite detail with other examples you can practice to understand the basic concept of Martin City transformation. So I will basically, I will follow the content of this book, but quite compressed form due to the uh, lack of the lecture time. So as I announced, we will have final examination on 12th of the June. And uh, I, I try to finish complete the class uh, the early or well, the first or seven or June and then we will have final examination and I hope you also submit the problem set on that day. As I told you, the classical uh, classification of the transformation in iron and steel is diffusion and diffusion risk. But recently, some people suggest that this kind of classification, reconstructive and displacive. The difference of reconstructive and displacive transformation is the movement of lattice atom during the transformation. We, you, you have to concern about the lattice atom, not the interstitials like carbon or nitrogen and some, so on. And during the reconstructive transformation, the movement of lattice atom is controlled by the diffusion. But in the dis dis displacement type transformation, the movement of the lattice atom is governed by deformation like uh, transformation strain. Sometimes it is called by an invariant plane strain or shape deformations and something like that. And as I told you, 
the location before and after the transformation, the location of the lattice atom is not determined in the reconstructive transformation because atom can move any direction by diffusion process. But when we concern, when we think about the displaced transformation, the movement of atom uh, accompanying the transformation is already determined by transformation theory. So we can predict, for example, one atom in FCC structure can move to its position in the BCC structure. We can predict the relationship between two positions by the theory of the transformation. So it is prescribed by the uh, transformation theory of the Markov state transformation. So you will know soon when you when I uh, when I, when we finish the phenomenolo phenomenological theory of the Markov state transformation. Actually, the name of the Martin site is followed by this person, Adolf Martin. Actually, Adolf Martin, him by, uh, he did not discover the Martin site, but he did quite big, he did quite big contribution to the field of metallography. Metallography is a, a field of the subject which handles the microstructures of the uh, materials. And actually, the Osmond first uh, found the detailed microstructures of the martensite. So he gives martensite to honor the adult Martin for his big contribution to this field. Martin site transformation is can be found in other alloy system. Not that is not a special one in for the uh, ferrous alloy. For example, some uh, ceramics and some non-ferrous alloys. You can also observe the Martin site transformation, <clears throat> and also the Martin site start temperatures is quite diverse range. For example, ceramics, the start temperature is quite high. In iron and its alloy, usually the martin temp start temperature is uh, 400 degrees Celsius, and sometimes it below the room temperatures. And some non-ferrous alloys, also you can observe the martin transformation. But basically, the fact you can observe the Martin Cedric transformation at very low temperatures. And the Martin's growth rate of the Martin site is very fast. You can confirm that from the TTT diagram. So as I mentioned, usually the transformation which is associated with diffusion has this C-type curve because there is a time necessary, necessary time to, for the atom to diffuse to, uh, for the transformation. But when you look at the transformation curves, which is related to the Martin side, this is horizontal curves, horizontal line, which means that when you decrease the temperatures to certain temperatures, you can readily ob obtain the, this, this amount of the martensite, which means that the transformation kinetics is very fast, so it does not show this kind of C curves. And uh, well-known empirical equation, empirical relationship to predict the volume fraction of martensite 
And this is koester malberg equation. And here, beta is uh, this amount of the constant, and ms is Martin size dark temperatures. And tq is when you cool down the specimen to these temperatures, you can obtain this amount of martensite. This equation called constant marble equation, and this is the empirical equation by analyzing uh, a variety of the steels with various composition. Of course, this constant is buried with the alloy system, but uh, the overall value is about this, this one. So what you can imagine from this equation is that that equation does not contain any terms of on time. So it only depends on the quenching temperatures. So from this empirical equation, you can understand that the martensitic transformation does not associate it with time dependent phenomena. So this kind of things, which is that the martensite forms very low temperatures, but it grows very fast. So it excludes the possibility of the diffusion, atomic diffusion during the transformation. That's why we call martensitic transformation. That's why we regard martensitic transformation as a diffusion risk. One thing interesting when we look at the crystallography features of the martensite is that this is the lattice parameter of the austenite as a function of carbon. When we put the carbon into the austenite, it stretch the lattice, the austenite, and the degree of the stretching is not dependent on crystallography direction. So when we put the carbon, the lattice parameter monotonously increase without any dependency in the crystallographic direction. But when the carbon content in martensite increase, the stretch or shrink of the lattice parameter appear differently depending on the crystallographic directions. So when we increase the carbon content, some crystallographic directions, the lattice parameter of some crystallographic direction increase, but when, it, when the concentration of carbon increase, sometimes the lattice parameter of specific direction is decreased. This fact comes from that the position of the carbon in martensite is inherited from the position of the carbon in the austenite because martensite transformation is not related with the diffusion of carbon. This is FCC structure which represented austenite. So as you know, most possible interstitial site for the carbon in austenite is here, octahedral site, right? As you know, the carbon in octahedral site deform the austenite isotropically. Right? The carbon in octahedral site deform the austenite lattice
isotropically. Isotropically means that there is no dependence in the direction, right? That's why in previous slide, we can observe the monotonous increase of the lattice parameter as the increase of the carbon content. But when we cool down the austenite, as you know, the austenite is likely to transform into the martensite. And the best way to minimize the atomic motion is to deform this BCT structure here into BCC structure, which is called the Bain deformation. We will handle this deformation in later class, but intuitively you can understand this, this structure here in the FCC structures can be transformed the BCC structure by compression of this axis and stretching along these two axes, right? That is the best way to minimize the movement of an atom, to convert FCC to BCC, right? But when the carbon atom exists on the octahedral side, that carbon atom hinders the compression along this direction because it stretch it would like to stretch the lattice. So when there is a carbon atom in octahedral site, the BCT structure is not sufficiently compressed along this direction. Right? So that's why we have some anisotropy in lattice parameter when the carbon atom in martensite crystal, uh, martensite crystal. When you look at the martensite through the optical micrograph, a microscope, it is very difficult to quantify or to observe the details of the microstructure. When you look at the martensite through the optical microscope, you will observe either these two types of the martensite. This is called the less martensite, and this is called plate or lenticular uh, martensite. It is not clear why the martensite structures have either the less or lenticular plate structures, but it is believed to be related with the driving force, difference in driving force. When you look at this two type of the uh, martensite structure through the transmission electron microscope, you can differentiate the details of the microstructures. Here, when you look at the microstructure of the less martensite through the transmission electron microscope, you can observe this kind of thin, thin very thin plate, which is called the less. And when you look at the plate time martensite, plate time martensite through the transmission electron microscope, you can observe this kind of fine twins. So I will show you later the tr transformation mechanism of the martensite is closely related with twinning or slip. So when you look at the this less, you can, you can observe very high density of the dislocation. 
which means that some kind of slipping occurs. Not slipping, slipping. So slip or twin is quite big, quite important concept to understand the theory of the Martin side uh, transformation. And actually, the theory firstly predict the slip or twinning inside of the Martin side plate. And then people observed those kind of structures. Actually, the theory of Martin side transformation was developed in 1950s. At that time, the transmission the techniques of transmission electron microscope was not that successful. And people firstly observed the details of Martin side structures about uh, uh, end of 60s. So theory went first, and observ observation follows. And it confirms the theory was uh, Right. Properly describe the inside of the martensitic transformation. When the martensite intersect the free surface, it causes this kind of characteristic features, which is called surface relief. It shows that the martensite, this martensite plate formed by some procedure which is similar to the deformation of the parent space. Parent space means that the austenite. And when you look at this line, It has a continuous features along the interface between the martensite and the austenite. It means that this martensite plate can be formed by some pro procedure which is similar to the deformation, but the Plane, the interface between the Martin site and parent space is not affected by that kind of deformation. Which means that the interface between the Martin site and parent austenite is invariant. So we call that invariant plane in austenite as a heavy plane. When you look at the papers or some other things on the martensite transformation, you uh, frequently heard about the heavy plane. The heavy plane means that the invariant plane between the martensite and parent austenite, which uh, is not affected by the deformation during the transformation. There are three kinds of invariant plane which is accompanying the deformation. You can define three types of deformation which has invariant plane. The first one is uniaxial dilatation. Just pull this cube and you can see this plane, this bottom plane, will be invariant. 
right? That is, that plane is not affected by the deformation. Second one is simply shear. Here, the original shape, and we can shear. We can deform by uh, deform the cube by simple shear, and the final shape will be this one. And also, this plane will be invariant plane. And the third type is the combination of this unexial dilatation and simple shear. And dilatation and shear. This is general type of invariant plane strain. And also here, this plane will be invariant plane. So when we observed macroscopically the shape of the martensite plate and thought the deformation control govern the martensite transformation is IPS, invariant plane strain. So which among these three types, which one can be the one describing the invariant plane strain during the martensitic transformation. When you look at the shape, shape of the martensite side plate, you can guess some shear transformation, shear deformation control the shape deformation during the transformation. So you can easily imagine that no one of these two type of IPS can describe the shape deformation during the martensitic transformation. And one thing you have to consider is that there is a volume expansion during the FCC to BCC transformation because BCC is more open structure, right? So volume of the austenite, the volume of the material will increase during the austenite to martensite transformation. In that sense, this general invariant plane strain, which contains dilatation terms as well as the short term, will be proper invariant plane strain to describe the shape deformation during the martensitic transformation, right? Even though the shape deformation accompanying the martensitic transformation is general type of the invariant strain, which contains the dilatation and short term, then why the shape of the martensite? We can observe through the microscope will be thin plate type. That is related with the strain energy which is caused by the shape deformation during the transformation. If there is no constraint, it means that if the martensite plate can freely deform, can freely be deformed during the transformation, it will have this kind of shape. But in most of the case, when martensite grow, it is surrounded by neighboring austenite. So for the growth of the martensite plate, the growth is constrained by surroundings. Those kind of constraint can cause elastic strain energy. 
So the martensite plate should have the shape to minimize the generation of the strain energy during the growth. Here, this equation is the plastic strain energy, which has uh, this kind of, here S is the strain, which is correspondent, uh, corresponding to the shear term, and delta is the strain, which is correspond to the dilatation terms. When this is the strain associated with the general IPS, then the elastic strain energy is given by this one. Here, C and R is the ratio of the thickness and the uh, uh, diameter of the plate. When C is equal to R, which means that the spherical type. So as you can see, when C, the ratio C to R become large, it can reduce the strain energy, right? So that's why general, generally the shape we can observe when you look at the microstructures of the martensite, it has a plate type of the shape. And this is due to the minimization of the strain energy. So you have to understand when you think about the martensite transformation, martensite plate forms from the austenite with heavy plane, which is macroscopically invariant plane. But when we look at more details, on the martensite transformation. There are several problems we have to solve to properly describe the nature of the martensite transformation. The first thing is that the index of the heavy plane. When you look at the shape of the shape of martensite here, you are likely think you are likely to think that this kind of shear can be formed by slip along this heavy plane. But when people look at the index of that heavy plane, the index of heavy plane is irrational. Irrational means that the index itself do not have integer. And moreover, the index of the heavy plane is quite a strange number, close to this plane, not exactly matches with this plane, and close to this plane. And as you know, what the slip plane of the austenite FCC structure is 111. Right? Slip plane of the austenite is, will be 111. And this is not 111 plane. So if we have a proper theory 
proper theory of the martensite transformation. It have to give you an answer that why this plane, the index of this plane is not the slip plane of the austenite. And you can easily understand that if this is a slip plane of austenite, that shape, this kind of shape can be formed by slip of series of this dislocation, right? But if the dislocation, that dislocation is perfect dislocation, the crystal structures of this bottom side and upper side will be the same. Perfect dislocation moves the atom to the lattice point to lattice point, right? So the crystal structure will not change. So simple passage of this dislocation cannot explain the change of the crystal structures. The only things happen in martensite transformation with this way is the FCC to HCP transformation. You may heard about the Epsilon martensite. Usually the martensite with BCC structure is alpha prime martensite. BCC structure. This is HCP structure. Usually epsilon martensite can be observed in the, some special steels with the uh, high manganese content. Anyway, Austenite to epsilon martensite, FCC to HCP transformation. For that case, this kind of slip of the dislocation can explain that martensite transformation. How? If this dislocation is a partial dislocation. Usually, the stacking sequence along 111 plane in FCC structures is ABC, ABC, right? The passage of the partial dislocation in every other layer can convert the stacking sequence AB, 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 right? So the movement of the partial dislocation on the 111 plane can explain the FCC to HCP transformation, but not in general transformation, which convert FCC structure to BCC structures. So, as I mentioned, the theory of martensite transformation can explain the irrational habit index of the habit plane, which is observed in general martensite transformation. And the second one the theory should have to answer is that the orientation relationship between the martensite and austenite. As you know, 
There is an orientation relationship between the Martin site and our site. Orientation relationship with specific parallelism between plane, plane to direction to direction. So usually between the Austinite and Martin site, people observe usually two kinds of orientation relationship, which is called Kurumov Sox or Ishiyama Barsaman orientation relationship. Kruzumov Sox orientation relationship is a parallelism between the cross packed plane in FCC and BCC. So the one on one in FCC and one on zero in BCC. The, those two plane is parallel and the parallel of cross packed direction. One on zero in FCC and one on one one on one direction in BCC. So those kind of two parallelism is the cruise of sox orientation relationship. Another one is that the Nishama Barstaman orientation relationship is that the parallel of the cross pack plane but slightly rotation of the cross pack direction about 5.3 5 degree. The important thing is that even though we can say that the Martin site and Austinite has those kind of orientation relationship, but that is not exact orientation relationship. What you can observe is close orientation relationship to close to Kruzum of Sachs or, or Nishama Parsaman. That this orientation relationship is not perfect orientation relationship between the Martin site and Austinite. Of course, real orientation relationship is close to either of this one, these two, either of this one, but not exactly matches. So the theory, Martin site transformation theory, also have to answer about the irrational orientation relationship between the Martin site and the Austinite. And the third one is related with the interface. As I told you, the Martin site transformation occurs very fast with very fast kinetics. Sometimes the movement velocity of interface is faster than the speed of sound. It means that the interface between the Martin site and the Austinite should be coherent or semi coherent. Why? This slide shows three kind of interface between two pays. This is incoherent interface, and this is coherent, and this is semi-coherent interface. When two pays, the interface between two pays is in incoherent interface, the movement of the, this interface should be controlled by diffusion. But as I told you, the speed of the interface between the Martin site and Austinite is very fast. So this kind of diffusional process cannot keep pace with that velocity. And how about coherent interface? Usually when there is two pace, it is very difficult to keep coherent interface for to make 
the coherent interface between two phase, very specific conditions should be satisfied. For example, the crystallographic structures of two phase should be the same, and the lattice mismatch should be small. But as you know, the crystallographic structure of martensite and austenite is dissimilar. And the lattice mismatch is not that small to make a coherent interface. So it is impossible to make coherent interface between martensite and the austenite. So the only way, the only case for the interface between the martensite and austenite will be the semi-coherent interface. When we think about the semi-coherent interface, semi-coherent interface can be described by the introduction of interface dislocation. And some part of interface has coherent structures and the region which contains this dislocation has incoherent structures. But overall structure can be said to be semi-coherent. And the movement of this interface is described by the movement of the dislocation. Right? So the thing you have to consider is whether the dislocation can move fast enough. Because the movement of dislocation determine the velocity of the interface. Right? So what kind of condition will be necessary for the fast movement of the interface dislocation? When you think about the movement of the dislocation, there are two kinds of movement. One is conservative motion, and the other is non-conservative motion. Anyone who attend the class of the dislocation? So what is the difference between the conservative motion and non-conservative motion? The difference between the conservative and non-conservative motion is conservation of the extra half plane. And in other words, non-conservative conservative motion is dislocation movement along its slip plane. Non-conservative motion is dislocation mo motion which is not belong to which does not belong to its slip plane. Here, this is two cases of non-conservative and conservative motion. Here, for the movement of interface, this dislocation should climb up, right? But as you know, the slip plane of this, this dislocation is here, right? Because the dislocation line is here, and bolus vector is here, and slip plane is the plane contains dislocation line and bolus vector, right? The plane perpendicular this screen will be the slip plane of the dislocation. So the movement along this direction will be non-conservative motion, and for this non-conservative motion, the diffusion of 
vacancy is required, right? Diffusion of vacancy is required. So non-conservative motion is not fast enough to describe the motion of interface during the Martin side transformation. On the other hand, this dislocation, here the low angle boundary, low angle boundary along this direction, and when you think about the movement of this boundary, this dislocation, movement of this dislocation is confined on its slip plane. Right? So it does not require any diffusion of process, just slip of dislocation of its slip plane is sufficient for the movement of interface. So to explain the fast speed of the interface between the martensite and austenite, the interface should be semi-coherent and the dislocation movement should be conservative motion. Okay. And one more thing which is necessary is that the interface dislocation should be one, only one set of dislocation moving with conservative motion. Glissile dislocation is the dislocation move with conservative motion. Why should we have only one set of glissile dislocation? If the interface consists of two or more set of dislocation, then with the movement of the interface, the intersection of dislocation occurs. If the dislocation is not parallel, which is one set, if we have one more set, it eventually have interaction to each other. And those kind of interaction of two, dis two different dislocation can make a job which correspond to the Burgos vector of another dislocation. Even though the original dislocation has a glissile dislocation, there is no guarantee that this joked part also glissile. So this joked part can hinder the movement of the dislocation. So we have to think about only one set of glissile dislocation in the interface between the martensite and the austenite. These things give you very important property of the interface between the martensite and austenite. This in the property of interface give you very important property of the martensitic transformation. Let's see, this is an interface between the martensite and the austenite. And this is interface dislocation. When the transformation proceeds, this interface dislocation move front side, right? Move, move front side. When you think about 
the line which is parallel to this dislocation line. Is it changing with the movement of the interface? The line which is parallel to this dislocation line, it does not change with the movement of the interface. It means that the deformation which describes FCC to BCC, Austinite to Martin side transformation, is invariant line strain. The deformation itself does not change any vectors on along this line. That is similar to this case, the movement of low angle boundary. This is interface and this is dislocation line. And think about the vector perpendicular to this screen. Is it affected by the movement of this interface? The vector perpendicular to this screen is not affected. by the passage, passage of the interface. So there is a line which is not changes by the transformation. So the deformation which is associated with Austinite to Martin side transformation is invariant line strain. Here is the third difficulty. What we observe is invariant plane strain. Actually, the shape change, which is associated with the Martin side transformation, observe the shape change is invariant plane strain. But the interface character tell you the deformation associated with the Martin side transformation is invariant line strain. How can we reconcile this discrepancy? If we have proper transformation theory, it will, be, it will give you the answer. And we will talk about that in next class. OK? Any question? No? OK, then see you in Thursday.